Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the Society of the Cincinnati, Associates of the American Revolution Institute, ladies and gentlemen. I am Mark Wheat. I'm chairman of the History Committee of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I'd like to welcome you here to Anderson House, the headquarters of the Society in Washington, D.C. The American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati promotes knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence, first declared, then secured by arms, fulfilling the, the aims of the Continental Army officers who founded the Society of Cincinnati in 1783 to perpetuate the memory of that vast event. The Institute presents exhibitions and other public programs advocates preservation and provides resources to teachers and students to enrich understanding of our war for independence and the principles of men and women who secured liberty. The American Revolution Institute website and the YouTube channel bring nearly 500 recorded lectures and videos and a wealth of print and photographic material related to the American Revolution to researchers throughout the world. To advance our mission, the American Revolution Institute welcomes your financial support. And I can assure you that every donation is a sound investment in the future of our country. Please see me or the staff uh, of the American Revolution Institute after the lecture uh, to learn how you can get involved through your time, talent, and treasure. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Andrew Outen, the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Mark's a lot taller than I am here. Um, thank you, Mark, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us both here in person and virtually from afar. Um, tonight's Authors Talk, a uh, program that is made possible in part by a generous gift from the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati, features Dr. Jordan Taylor discussing his new book, Misinformation Nation, Foreign News and the Politics of Truth in Revolutionary America, published last month by Johns Hopkins University Press. Fake news is nothing new. Just like millions of Americans today, the revolutionaries of the 18th century worried that they were entering a post-truth era. Their fears, however, were not fixated on social media or clickbait, but rather on people's increasing reliance on reading news gathered from foreign newspapers. News was the lifeblood of early American politics, but newspaper printers had few reliable sources to report on events from abroad. Accounts of battles and beheadings, as well as declarations and constitutions often arrived alongside contradictory intelligence. Though frequently false, the information that Americans encountered in newspapers, letters, and conversations framed their sense of reality, leading them to respond with protest boycotts and violence. Tonight, Dr. Taylor will reveal how foreign news defined the boundaries of American politics and how the American Revolution was plagued by misperceptions, misunderstandings, and uninformed overreactions. Jordan Taylor is a historian of media and the American Revolution. He has taught at Indiana University Bloomington, Indiana University Southeast, and Indiana State University alongside Smith College. Dr. Taylor's scholarship has been published or is forthcoming in publications such as the Journal of the Early America, Early Republic, excuse me, Early American Studies, Book History, The New England Quarterly, Studies in Book Culture, and the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography. His public writing has also appeared in the Washington Post, Time, The Daily Beast, and the Journal of the American Revolution. So with all of that, without further delay, please join me in welcoming to Anderson House, Dr. Jordan Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you to the American Revolution Institute and the Society of the Cincinnati uh, for bringing me here and to all of you uh, for coming tonight. Uh, I'm excited to share a bit about the history of 
news and politics in revolutionary America. And I'm looking forward to your questions when I'm finished. So my new book, Misinformation Nation, is a study of how people in revolutionary America gathered and interpreted news about the world uh, and how that affected the era's politics. And I suppose the first point that I need to make uh, by way of providing some background context is that people in early America were obsessed with foreign news. They cared deeply about what was happening abroad. They understood that at that time they inhabited what most people in the world would have considered to be sort of a dull backwater. They believed that the great events of the day uh, would take place elsewhere, particularly in Europe. And uh, unlike today, when it's sometimes difficult to get Americans to care about the world outside of the United States, um, if anything, in the 18th century, the events that Americans were more invested in were those that took place abroad rather than in their own neighborhoods. In fact, if you look at the newspapers from the 18th century, uh, the priority of foreign news is very clear. Uh, depending on the issue, you'd often see two thirds or three quarters of the news content of uh, any given issue devoted to foreign news, often extracted from London papers. And I know this is actually very frustrating to some historians uh, who, who wanna read these newspapers to learn about what's happening in, in the United States uh, or to find things like political essays, which uh, are very exciting to some people, but unfortunately for them, fortunately for me, uh, these papers are often little more than a digest of news that was being printed in Europe, particularly in London. In a 1739, excuse me, poem in his Pennsylvania Gazette, Benjamin Franklin uh, explained to readers that he was not particularly interested in sharing news about Pennsylvania. He wrote, uh, if home occurrences that are well known and which concern but few are left alone, the printer sure deserves no blame for this. While in foreign news, he's not remiss. And whatever important ever happens here, he carefully collects and renders clear. In other words, Franklin is aware that his readers care primarily, at least, about foreign news. Unlike today, these newspapers were generally not sharing information uh, from, you know, sort of a London correspondent, certainly not a London bureau. Uh, instead, newspaper printers were gathering information usually one of two ways. First, by extracting paragraphs uh, from whatever letters they happened to come into contact with since the, since the last time they published an issue. And second, but most importantly, by reprinting materials from London newspapers. American printers were able to reprint news from the London press without attribution, without compensation, and without remorse. Uh, because at the time there were no international copy right laws that would sort of restrict the flow of this news. So it was, it was kind of a bit of a free-for-all. And as the London press expanded at a prodigious rate in the 18th century, American printers couldn't really keep up with the speed of news arriving. While Americans in the 17th century often sort of complained, they, they were bored out of their minds waiting for uh, news to arrive from Europe. By the late 18th century, Americans faced, if anything, an excess of news that forced newspaper printers to choose between many possible sources. And when there is an excess of information, as there was in the late 18th century, decisions about what information to share and what's to ignore inevitably became political. What news is significant? What news is most likely to be true? People could not agree on this. And so these decisions, you know, what was accepted, what was sort of tossed aside, those are in some ways the decisions that I wanna to talk to you about tonight. And while my book actually stretches from the early 18th century into the early 19th century, uh, I want to focus tonight on the 1760s and the 1770s, the era when American colonists first started to question their longstanding uh, imperial attachments and began to cook up what would become the American Revolution. Thinking about the political origins of the American Revolution is, I think, um, something that should be of interest not only to people like me who 
uh, who are very committed to the study of early America. But really, it should be of interest, I think, to, to every American. Unless we understand why the American Revolution came about, we really can't understand the nation that it birthed. The narratives we tell ourselves about the coming of the American Revolution are deeply connected to what it means to be an American. And for that reason, you know, we've been arguing about this question of motives, about what caused the revolution really since the beginning, since the revolution itself. And I could spend all night, I'm sure, going through all of the different ways that people have argued about this. Um, but as just sort of a quick two sentence summary, uh, there are kind of two explanations that have predominated for the last century or so among historians. First, that economic interests propelled uh, the colonists into revolution. And second, that the revolution was brought on by colonists' commitment to um, deeply held ideologies. And so that's sort of what historians argue about. Uh, in popular memory, it's, it's often a little bit less complicated. Um, you know, if you pick up a popular history of the American Revolution or watch uh, a film about the American Revolution, uh, you're likely to encounter a narrative that presents the heroic uh, revolutionaries rising against the oppressions of the villainous British, right? And tonight, I want to offer a different way of thinking about the coming of the American Revolution, one that focuses on how information mobilizes the political behavior of ordinary people. And a lot of the argument about what brought about the American Revolution comes down, really, I think, to what you, what you think about a much broader question, which is, um, why do people engage in politics in the first place? I think it's a good question, right? Politics, after all, is, is very inconvenient. Uh, I have a three-month-old at home, and I can tell you just getting out the door to vote on Tuesday was, was quite a challenge. We've all got busy lives. It's, it's not, you know, it's not very pleasant. It's annoying even to set aside whatever you're doing and, you know, go to vote or sign a petition or even change your consumption habits in, in response to a boycott. Politics can also be really unpleasant as I'm sure we have all experienced in the last few years. It can alienate you from, from friends, from family members, uh, from neighbors. So why don't people just sort of move on? Why don't people just accept things as they are? And so of course there are many possible reasons, but the point I wanna make is that nobody joins the political fray without developing two important perceptions. First, they need to believe that something is deeply wrong with the world. And second, they need to believe that by taking action, they can help to solve that problem. So the question I've become interested in is how did the revolutionary generation develop these two perceptions? Or as I'll suggest tonight, these two misperceptions perhaps. Because when you look at the premises that guided the American revolutionaries to action, their conjoined beliefs that something was deeply wrong with the world that they inhabited and that their actions could help to set it right, uh, they were often quite wrong. Their beliefs about the British government and about their place within it uh, were often founded on misinformation or you know, what we would today often call fake news. As we've seen in recent years, fake news can affect elections. It can guide legislators. Um, it can even lead to violence. This was no less true in the 18th century. Back then, it could even cause a revolution. So this story starts, in a way, with the beginning of English colonization in North America. And that's because colonization created a problem for the British Empire. Unlike you know, Spain or Portugal or France, Britain's government was supposed to contain some popular Republican elements. Decisions were supposed to be made through a process of deliberation rather than through arbitrary rule. That was what the colonists expected. That was what they considered to be uh, one of their rights as Englishmen. 
But the issue was that political deliberation only really works if political leaders are making decisions based on good information. And British leaders generally didn't know that much about the colonies. After a few generations of migration, for that matter, most Americans didn't really know that much about Britain either. So the colonies could only participate in the British government by sending and receiving information through letters, through printed materials, and um, through speech, through rumors even. They could make themselves known to the empire's decision makers only really through these media. But of course, you know, these forms of communications were often unreliable um, on both ends, right? Rumors are, are rumors. Uh, newspapers, in a lot of cases, were barely worth the, the paper that they were printed on. This was before anyone used the term journalism to describe newspapers. And letters were really only as trustworthy as the people who were writing them. So the British government learned to rely pri primarily on private letters written by officials in the colonies, especially the governors, for news about the colonies. In fact, the various leaders uh, in Britain, keeping the various leaders in Britain, excuse me, apprised about events in the colonies was one of the most important jobs that a colonial governor had. Simultaneously, colonial deliberative bodies, so um, legislative bodies in particular, learned to rely on uh, their own agents in London for information about events there. Colonial agents who were usually merchants or, or uh, just a well-connected individual uh, would lobby on behalf of colonial interests and they would transmit accounts of Britain back to the colonies. And so in effect, governors were London's representatives in the colonies, just as agents were the colonies' representatives in London. Ideally, governors and agents helped to bring the British world together by providing a reliable stream of information that would make one side of the Atlantic intelligible to those on the other side. And, you know, the system sort of worked, at least for a while. Colonial, colonial governors shared news about the colonies, but because it would take, uh, you know, often four months or more for them to get any responses to their accounts, the London leadership also allowed them uh, room to sort of improvise in response to changing conditions. Ultimately, though, this empire was tied together by communications networks that were much too fragile to survive for very long. And when the Seven Years' War caused the British national debt to balloon, uh, which led the government to seek revenue in the colonies, the colonists began to point out this flaw in the imperial arrangement. The Stamp Act of 1765 marked the beginning of this critique. And you know, if you've studied the American Revolution in any depth, you're probably bored to death with the Stamp Act. I know that my students uh, have been when I've when I've talk, taught about the imperial crisis, but there's a reason we taught so much about the Stamp Act. It's important because it was one of those points when the colonists first began to articulate their critique of taxation without representation. And it was also the beginning of their fears about misrepresentation. During the debate about the Stamp Act in Parliament, uh, members debated how Britain could make laws for the colonies when most of them didn't know much about that part of the world. With an almost total unacquaintedness with the colonists, as one member of parliament put it, how could they be said to represent them? According to an account transmitted back to the colonies by a Connecticut uh, agent named Jared Ingersoll, who, who witnessed these debates, uh, a member of parliament named Colonel Isaac Barre, who's pictured there, uh, explained that it was preposterous for parliament to tax the colonies when they were acting, or quote, acting very much in the dark and knew so little about the colonies. An occasional letter from a governor was not enough to allow them to rule effectively. Uh, governors and other officers in the colonies, according to Barre, uh, did little more than to, quote, spy out their liberty, to misrepresent the, their actions, and to prey upon them. Barre was one of the few members of parliament who had spent a substantial amount of time in the colonies, uh, having served as an officer there during the Seven Years' War. And Barre's speech, became a bit of a sensation in the colonies where it was widely printed and read. If it's remembered at all today, it's usually because 
uh, Barre coined the term Sons of Liberty to describe the, uh, the colonists, which was you know, obviously adopted by the radical group that was agitating for colonial rights. But the heart of the speech really was its concern that parliament simply didn't have enough information to govern the colonies effectively. Spurred in part by Barre's speech, uh, this was a charge. This charge about misrepresentation was one that Patriot colonists were to repeat again and again in the late 1760s and early 1770s. They believed that British administrators uh, in the colonies were sharing harmful and false accounts of them with London policymakers, which was causing the empire to make bad decisions based on bad information. From this perspective, the imperial crisis was not just a constitutional crisis, it was also a crisis of communication. The Stamp Act caused a cascade of protests and disobedience toward British authorities. Not least of these uh, protesters, by the way, were newspaper printers whose business was threatened by the Stamp Act. Uh, the Stamp Act would have raised uh, the price of pamphlets, of newspapers, and of all kinds of paperwork. Uh, it, there's a good chance it could have run many printers out of business, in fact. And so printers helped to create an alternative channel of communications, which often defied the rules of colonial governors. Newspapers helped to incite ongoing protests, particularly in Boston, uh, where mob violence became a source of annoyance to British administrators. Bostonians um, regularly intimidated and threatened the customs commissioners sent there to collect taxes. In the summer of 1768, for example, a huge mob of Bostonians attacked British officials who tried to collect tariff duties on wine that had been smuggled aboard the ship Liberty, which was owned by John Hancock. And so reports of this and many other uh, sort of similar incidents led London officials to conclude that the city had become dangerously unstable and that the government there was unable to enforce the laws. And generally speaking, these reports were mostly correct. Um, the extent of mob violence is, is something that historians still like to argue about, but no one seriously argues today that Boston was a quiet and, and law-abiding place in the late 1760s. Uh, no one argues that today in the 1760s, Bostonians did claim that though. Uh, they had a very different story to tell. According to them, accounts of mob violence were wildly exaggerated and the people were just peacefully, if insistently, uh, pushing for the government to recognize their rights. And so when the British government uh, sent two regiments to Boston to restore control of the city, many colonists were, were flabbergasted. Uh, you can see that attitude in this, this uh, engraving by Paul Revere. Uh, which, by the way, is on the cover of my book. Uh, it's a very carefully rendered representation of the landing of British troops in Boston. For Revere and other Massachusetts patriots, the troops were not arriving to restore order to a rowdy, disordered town. Uh, rather, this image depicts, depicts a fairly peaceful-looking city, right? Um, dominated by church steeples in the background. The streets are empty and the city is beset upon by this sort of red mass of invading soldiers. So in Revere's view, uh, the soldiers are the aggressors. They're the ones who are responsible for bringing disorder into Boston. The, the arrival of British troops in Boston mattered so much to the Patriot colonists and preoccupied them for years afterward uh, because it seemed to exemplify how false news was bringing the conflict between themselves and the British empire about. John Adams later remembered that uh, the arrival of troops in Boston was a sign that, quote, everything we could do was misrepresented and nothing we could say was credited. Because patriots maintained that their protests were peaceful, the only possible explanation for the arrival of these troops was that someone was being dishonest about conditions in the colonies. It seemed like uh, Governor Francis Bernard, governor of Massachusetts, and his allies were spreading, according uh, to the Boston town meeting, quote, false, scandalous, and infamous libels upon the inhabitants of this town. Uh, this accusation was the simplest way to resolve the seeming contradiction between apparently peaceful conditions and oppressive actions by the empire. This claim allowed the colonists to resist without exactly rebelling. Uh, 
Uh, they didn't call the British Empire tyrannical, at least at first. Instead, they, uh, they were able to simply think of British leaders as being misinformed. Samuel Adams, who became one of the uh, sort of chief antagonists of the Bernard administration, wrote that, quote, interested and false mediums uh, had deceived London about the colonies. He believed that, quote, those persons whose misrepresentations have procured troops to be quartered among us had also caused the troops to be particularly confrontational. Patriots fixated on the letters that Francis Bernard, who's on the left there, uh, wrote to his superiors. The Massachusetts House of Representatives directed its agent in London to work to combat Bernard's representations or misrepresentations. Massachusetts patriots even petitioned Bernard and then eventually the king to turn over copies of his letters to London, but Bernard refused. A few months after the British troops arrived in Boston though, the town's patriot leaders finally obtained six copies of letters that Bernard had sent to London. And frustratingly for these colonists, uh, there was really nothing new in them. They were generally quite consistent with Bernard's public statements. Uh, they were mostly just complaining about the way that uh, the Massachusetts Council had been uncooperative with quartering troops in Boston. But the Patriot colonists nevertheless insisted that these letters unmasked Bernard's longstanding campaign of misrepresentation against them. Years later, a nearly identical process played out after Patriots, uh, with the help of Ben Franklin actually, got their hands on the letters of Thomas Hutchinson, who's on the right there, um, who had succeeded Bernard as governor of Massachusetts. Again, these letters were not particularly exciting in a lot of ways, uh, but Patriots managed to sort of whip up a, a popular frenzy based on frankly, some, some exaggerations and out of context quotations. One of these, really my favorite of, of these was an account that Hutchinson had written about the landing of British troops in Boston in October, 1768. Uh, Hutchinson had accused the angry American colonists of organizing to attack the British troops as they landed at Boston Harbor. Uh, he claimed that someone had placed a tar barrel in an elevated place near the harbor so that uh, it could be lit on fire when the troops were approaching and so that the mob would come and attack the soldiers. Uh, when this uh, part of Hutchinson's letter was made public in 1773, it you know, understandably infuriated Bostonians. Um, when he read it in a newspaper, a Boston shopkeeper named Harbottle Door, one of my favorite names from the revolutionary era wrote, you can see, um, he sort of wrote in the margins of his copy, a lie, a vile lie, you know. Frustrated by this piece of information, which does seem to have been false, uh, Bostonians took affidavits from the workmen who had removed the barrel years earlier and witnesses who had seen the barrel moved uh, because they wanted to prove this was just an empty barrel, or at least it wasn't full of tar. Uh, because if it wasn't full of tar, it wouldn't be a very good beacon to uh, bring a mob to attack the uh, British soldiers landing. So this is just one of many, many examples of the kinds of communications that Patriot writers and leaders focused on. They were all, you know, in a lot of cases, I should say, they were small things, relatively minor, a barrel, right? Uh, but in Patriot eyes, together they added up to a very dangerous and, and false narrative about colonial disorder. Because they feared that Hutchinson, Bernard, and others were sending false and inflammatory accounts of the colonies to London, patriots went out of their way to prove them wrong. Patriot colonists frequently sent what we might you know, today call fact checks to Britain in the form of letters to their agents, petitions, as well as uh, pamphlets composed at the instigation of colonial deliber deliberative bodies, such as the Boston Town Meeting. Uh, and the intent of these was to challenge government information sources. Historians have often sort of thought of these as, as forms of propaganda um, used to mobilize fellow Americans into action. But the audience for these texts, these accounts was not primarily other colonists, uh, but was often people in Britain. The Boston Town Meeting's pamphlet, which was intended to fact check Bernard's letters uh, was titled An Appeal to the World, 
uh, with a subtitle or a vindication of the town of Boston from any false and malicious aspersions. Likewise, after the Boston massacre, a pamphlet was distributed refuting uh, British soldiers' accounts of the events, but it was only distributed in England. And to some extent, these, these fact checks were effective. Uh, patriots could read extracts from London newspapers that described Britain's toasting, uh, may the unrepresented Americans be no longer misrepresented. Another account from London that was reprinted in Patriot newspapers commented, much has been said of a virtual representation with the, which the colonies are supposed to have here, but we know what kind of actual representation or rather misrepresentation is continually made of them by those from whom administration chiefly have their information. This idea that British officials were misrepresenting the Americans to London uh, was really the consensus position of the Patriots for many years. And it had an important impact on the ways that colonists organized their resistance. On the one hand, this, this conversation about misrepresentation undermined British political authority. For more than a century, British leaders in the colonies had wielded the power to define what was true and what was false. Um, they had been able to prosecute people for spreading false news and had often been able to restrain printers and other news mediators from spreading information that they didn't like. It was rare for colonists to challenge the British government's ability to define truth. Um, if you're familiar with the famous case of John Peter Zanger, the New York printer, uh, who was acquitted on seditious on charges of seditious libel uh, against the colony's governor? Um, that's noteworthy because it was exceptional, right? Uh, not because that was the norm. In fact, similar prosecutions happened uh, for years after that. Really, it wasn't until the 1760s that British American colonists started to consistently challenge colonial uh, administrators' authority as tellers of truth. In 1769, for example, one writer in the Patriot newspaper, the Boston Gazette, uh, explained that Governor Francis Bernard was the colony's highest authority, but that didn't make him the colony's best authority. In other words, just because the colonists needed to obey Bernard and other leaders, that didn't mean that they should trust him. The colonists were undermining British rule in part by undermining its authority to define what was real in the world, what was true. Instead of the, quote, bare affirmation of a gentleman unsupported by any evidence, uh, as this writer described Bernard's letters, colonists increasingly argued that uh, the collective voice of a city or the people as a whole should be trusted to describe what was true in the colonies. But while the critique of misrepresentation eroded confidence in the British government conceiving of the conflict as being primarily about misrepresentation, miscommunication, and misperception also allowed the colonists to believe that this was a problem that could eventually be resolved. A 1768 letter in the Boston Gazette, for example, suggested that since misrepresentation, quote, has been the chief cause of distraction, then a removal of distraction may be the means of reconciliation. Colonists thought that if they sent enough petitions, letters, and pamphlets eastward, it would eventually clear up what even Ben Franklin, who was living in London at the time, referred to as our misunderstanding. It wasn't really until Thomas Paine's uh, publication of Common Sense in early 1776 that the colonists started to think of this critique of miscommunication and misrepresentation as being sort of a, a, an unsolvable broader issue for the empire. Paine turned these concerns uh, into broader fears about monarchy and empire. He wrote, there is something, quote, exceedingly ridiculous in the composition of monarchy. It first excludes a man from the means of information, uh, the king, yet empowers him to act in cases where the highest judgment is required. He also took a dim view of sort of the long distance nature of communications required in a vast empire like the British Empire, uh, explaining that Britons would, uh, would remain, quote, very ignorant of us, regardless of any petitions the colonists might send to them. Uh, he continued to, quote, to be always running three or 4,000 miles with a tale or a petition, waiting four or five months for an answer, which when obtained requires five or six more to explain it, was just absurd, right? 
Instead of immediately inciting rebellion against the empire, this conversation about the dangers of fake news or false news in the British empire bred a powerful skepticism among the American colonists about the information that they were receiving from Britain. But of course, uh, just as today, uh, the colonists did not apply this skepticism evenly. Instead, patriots applied great scrutiny uh, toward news sources associated with the British ministry. You can see the heading of this um, uh, sort of extract from a Patriot newspaper, which referred to the British ministry's newspaper, the London Gazette, as the London or Lying Gazette, uh, more or less telling readers how to, uh, how to interpret the following uh, sentences. At the time, loyalists aimed the same level of scorn uh, toward new sources produced by the British Whig opposition, which was challenging the, uh, the policies put forward by the British ministry. I actually spent a long time looking at the ways that Patriot and Loyalist newspapers cited newspapers um, printed abroad and across thousands and thousands of issues. The pattern is pretty clear. Patriot newspapers uh, skewed heavily toward citing London newspapers associated with the British Whig opposition party, uh, such as the St. James's Chronicle, the Morning Chronicle, and the Public Advertiser, whereas uh, Loyalist newspapers showed a marked preference for newspapers like the London Gazette, right? The, the British Ministries paper or, or other friendly, ministry-friendly papers like the London Chronicle or the Morning Herald. In the 21st century here today, uh, the result of this kind of information polarization will probably be relatively predictable to us. Um, just as someone today uh, develops a different view of the world if they watch MSNBC versus someone who watches Fox News, uh, colonists in the 1770s started to develop separate, uh, irreconcilable views of the world based on their different information gathering practices. Colonists were aware that their rivals were gathering different kinds of information from them. In 1774 and 1775, for example, a debate broke out in a New York Loyalist newspaper printed by James Rivington uh, and a neighboring Patriot paper printed by John Holt. Essayists accused each other of sharing only news that suited their political aspirations. A loyalist accused Holt, the Patriot printer, of having always chosen intelligence that disparaged, quote, the ministry and the parliament intended to widen the breach between Great Britain and the colonies. This partiality is so glaring, he wrote, that a boy of 10 years old cannot fail observing it. Patriots responded by accusing Rivington of, quote, publishing such parts of letters from London and elsewhere as can be made to suit their purpose and suppressing the rest. And indeed, if you look at what these two papers were publishing, these accusations are kind of fair enough uh, because Holt and Rivington published in the same city and because they usually published on the same day of the week. Uh, you might expect that some of the news that they published would, would sort of overlap, that it would be the same, right? But it generally wasn't. In one of the issues publishing these debates, uh, for example, Holt published 13 columns of news derived from London papers, and almost all of that supported Patriot narratives about the escalating conflict. It contained accounts of an English Duke in Parliament wishing the Patriot colonists well, it contained a report that France and Britain were about to uh, find themselves at war with each other, and it described dissent in the House of Lords over the ministry's treatment of Massachusetts. In the same day, in the same city, Rivington uh, shared reprints that included a description of how the British ministry were, quote, determined to stand their own ground with respect to the Americans. Uh, he also included a direct refutation of the idea that Britons broadly supported the American patriots. And he also included uh, accounts predicting that native peoples would soon attack Virginia. So if you read Holt's paper, on the one hand, you got the sense that the British ministry was distressed and that the London opposition was emboldened. If you read Rivington's paper, on the other hand, you got pretty much the exact opposite sense. And it, it should be said here, by the way, that neither printer was fabricating these reports. Neither of them was just sort of making them up out of whole cloth. Uh, instead, they just made different choices about what kind of information they would reprint for their readers. Going back to that point, I made earlier by the 1770s, news mediators like Holt and Rivington 
had more news to share than they really knew what to do with. Um, and so they made highly politicized choices about what to include for their readers, which tended to support, of course, the preferred narratives that they had about the world. And the result of this kind of uh, selection bias, if you will, was that patriots and loyalists developed very different ideas about how the escalating conflict between the colonies and um, Britain would play out. As Holt's paper indicates, patriots thought that most people in Britain actually supported them. In one month in 1774, for example, uh, Connecticut Patriot newspaper shared reports claiming variously that two out of three, three quarters, and 99 in 100 Britons supported uh, the colonial protests. The Patriots also believed that the British parliamentary leadership headed by Lord North was unpopular and was likely to fall from power at any moment. And they further believed that their boycotts would cause large scale social disruption that would topple the ministry. And once that happened, they expected that the new government that would replace the North ministry would reverse the policies that they hated. Loyalists didn't believe these things. Uh, sometimes they made fun of patriots for being deluded about them. Uh, a London printer named William Strahan regularly pointed out to an American correspondent that, quote, hardly a paragraph of news about London shared in patriot newspapers was true. A loyalist printer named Hugh Gain published a letter from London in his newspaper uh, that pointed out that the patriot faction was guided by information derived from, quote, false friends who conveyed from hence wrong accounts of the situation of affairs here, which made the Americans view them through a false medium. Another writer in the, the Boston newspaper, the, uh, the Boston Newsletter, wrote to his patriot neighbors that, quote, you have no notion how grossly you are imposed upon by friendly accounts. Uh, according to this writer, the patriots' uh, impl <laughs> implicit credulity uh, toward congenial news sources had built a baseless fabric of grievance. Certainly when they looked at the Declaration of Independence, loyalists found numerous examples of, in the long list of grievances uh, in the document's middle section of exaggerations, if not outright fabrications concerning British actions. Uh, uh, loyalists like Thomas Hutchinson, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he wrote a, a pamphlet called Strictures Upon the Declaration of Independence, which attempted to sort of fact check the document uh, and poke some holes in the document's assertions about British policy and conditions in the colonies. And so I think it's worth actually taking this loyalist critique quite seriously. Um, I think it's, it's quite easy for us to dismiss uh, accounts of loyalists as being, you know, anti-colonial propaganda, anti-patriot propaganda, I should say, or as just being the result of sour grapes. But I don't think that's really very fair because if we're being honest uh, with ourselves about how the imperial crisis escalated into revolution, uh, I think the loyalist account was in a lot of ways uh, more often correct than the patriot account. With the benefit of hindsight, we can say that the Patriots were sort of ludicrously misinformed about their place within the British Empire and their impact on British politics. Most historians today would agree that the American boycotts didn't cause widespread economic disruption in Britain. Uh, they would agree that Britons outside of London did not predominantly support the American colonists. And they would have to agree that the North Ministry did not fall from power. It actually gained power in elections held in 1774 and then held on to power until 1782, the longest lasting ministry in decades. So in other words, uh, you know, to put it frankly, the American patriots couldn't have been more wrong about their understanding of the internal politics of Britain. And they developed these misperceptions by credulously reading the letters and newspapers created by uh, British opposition Whigs, you know, who had reason to maintain an anti-ministerial view of, event, of events. Communication scholars today uh, would describe this kind of thinking as confirmation bias or motivated reasoning. Uh, those are the tendency to accept things that align with your prior beliefs and either ignore or challenge things that don't align with your beliefs. And I would argue that these optimistic misperceptions were essential to Patriots' escalation of their resistance. When I, when I began, uh, I said that politics take place when a group develops these paired perceptions, that there's something wrong with the world, 
and that their actions can help to solve that problem. And the news that the Patriots encountered gave them reason to think that there was something wrong in the world. Uh, it led them to think that the British Empire was unjustly punishing them on the basis of false news spread by British colonial officers. The news that they encountered also led them to the misperception that their resistance could solve this problem by overturning the North Ministry. And this misunderstanding of conditions in Britain gave the Patriots the confidence to continue escalating the conflict. Those conjoined beliefs pushed Patriot resistance forward gradually, slowly, uh, in hopes that this agitation would have its desired effects. And I think this helps explain, by the way, uh, sort of the weird nature of uh, the, that decade between the Stamp Act in 1765 and the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Uh, it took 11 years, right, for the Patriots to decide that reconciliation was impossible. That's a very long time. And I think that makes most sense if you think about it in this context, where it seemed always that reconciliation was potentially just sort of one petition or one fact check away. And it's worth asking as well, if the American Patriots had a more accurate a picture of London politics, if they were not so steeped in misinformation, would their resistance have gone as far as it did? It's also worth asking if the Patriots' resistance would have been so gradual if they had not believed that the colonial officials who governed them uh, were misrepresenting them abroad. So combine together this fear of misinformation and the effects of misinformation defined the way that Patriots organized against the British Empire in the 1760s and 1770s. We often think about the American Revolution as being defined by a contest over big, important truths, right? Uh, truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness come to mind. But it was also an argument about numerous, smaller, more immediate truths uh, about what was just happening in the world around them. Revolutions, after all, are not just uh, a matter of big ideas playing themselves out. They require people to do things that, you know, in retrospect, often seem a little bit irrational, maybe even silly. Uh, in order to do something as, as arrogant and dangerous as taking on the British Empire, the greatest military power in the world at that time, the colonists had to be guided into that, I think, by some inaccurate beliefs. And so as I close, I want to return to a question I raised at the beginning of this talk. Um, the way we think about the causes of the American Revolution is important, I think, because it is so closely tied to Americans' understanding of their own identity. If Americans want to think of themselves as exceptional, they need to grasp onto a narrative of hardy, uh, heroic colonists overcoming the oppression of a villainous British empire. If Americans want to think of themselves as being connected together by a shared commitment to ideals rather than by membership in sort of a hair and bulk democracy, they need to think that big Republican and big liberal, you know, small R, small, small L, launched the American Revolution. But if we accept that the American Revolution was quite a bit messier in its origins, and that misinformation, misperceptions, and misunderstandings played an important role in bringing about that conflict, uh, then what does that mean for American identity? Uh, I've struggled with that question. I don't know that I have a great answer. Uh, and as I think through that question, I've often returned to um, the words of the founding generation themselves. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that many members of the founding generation, including some of the leading lights, the people that, that we know of, right? The people that, um, that we're familiar with did not see themselves as paragons of reason necessarily. Instead, they recognized that their generation was prone to fits of irrationality. Looking back on the era of the American Revolution in a letter uh, written in 1805, just a few years after he had lost um, re-election to the presidency, John Adams uh, grumpily wrote to a friend that, quote, the age of frivolity would be an appropriate 
uh, name for the era of uh, the late 18th century, though he, quote, would not object if you had named it the Age of Folly, Vice, Frenzy, Fury, Brutality, Demons, Bonaparte, Tom Paine, or the Age of the Burning Brand from the Bottomless Pit, or anything but the Age of Reason. When I read those words, and I think about the other uh, arguments about reality that occupied Americans during the revolution, I find it hard to accept the view that the founding generation erected an inerrant fabric of government uh, that we cannot improve upon, but can only accommodate ourselves to. Rather, I think that we honor the founders more when we approach the history of the American Revolution as a story of real human beings, sometimes with great ideas, uh, sometimes making big mistakes, uh, stumbling in a lot of ways toward greatness. The generation that founded the United States were not the unerring titans of virtue that we sometimes are, are that they're sometimes presented as. Like other humans, uh, the founders were susceptible to motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, and all kinds of cognitive error. They were often confused, deceived, or simply wrong in their understanding of the world. And I think, again, um, while we sometimes imagine that we live in a post-truth age and that social media have uh, made shared realities impossible, it's clear that it was, in a lot of ways, even more difficult for people in the era of the American Revolution to understand uh, what was true in the world. And this is, I think, almost counterintuitively kind of a hopeful place to end. Um, like John Adams, we, in, we inhabit uh, anything but the age of reason, I think we would agree. But perhaps like his generation, we can sort of muddle through uh, some extraordinarily challenging circumstances to enliven and strengthen the democracy that the founders set us down the path to. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Questions. Oh, sure. This one too. I think. Did you detect any British attempts to influence American public opinion, like subsidizing newspapers, clandestinely printing pamphlets, especially in the run up to the war? So, were there Russian trolls? Effectively, is that is that the question? Um, in the 18th century, yeah. I mean, certainly there were a lot of accusations about that. Um, and patriots often accused folks like James Rivington, Hugh Gain, and other, other loyalist printers of being uh, agents for uh, the British government. And you know, it's not far-fetched because we know that in Britain, there were uh, some really massive subsidies actually paid out to, uh, to government-friendly printers. Um, I think the evidence is a bit thin on that. And I think that in, in a sense, you didn't really need uh, people to, uh, to be sort of agents of the British government because the economic model was changing such that it was profitable already to, um, to create a newspaper that, um, that served the interests of the British government in certain parts of the colonies, especially New York and other sort of like loyalist um, uh, centers. So it's sort of a boring answer uh, to say, uh, I, I didn't find anything like that, but um, there's good reason for that, right? How did the Patriots, um... How were the patriots able to purloin the letters of colonial governors? And was there a dispute on their legitimacy uh, or whether they were uh, false propaganda? So um, the process through which uh, the letters of Hutchinson were, were taken remains somewhat mysterious. Um, we know that Ben Franklin serving in London as an agent for a number of um, colonial bodies at that time was involved. He admitted to this. Um, we know that another agent who died shortly before these letters were made public uh, 
he was also involved. Um, but kind of understandably, uh, a lot of people didn't really want to admit uh, to having participated in this because it, it was a fairly duplicitous, underhanded thing to do. <laughs> uh, and in the 18th century world, uh, letters were usually either marked as being private or for public um, reading and to contravene the intentions of a letter writer um, was sort of beyond the pale. Uh, and so there are some folks who we know were involved, um, but they went out of their way to obscure their involvement. Um, yeah, so it's it's one of those things that may never be fully understood. But uh, what's important to recognize is that uh, the Patriots did have allies in London who accepted their beliefs about misrepresentation, about the ways that um, Bernard Hutchinson and others were um, were uh, communicating to the British government. Um, there was another part of your question, I think, about um, about sort of the was was it about backlash? Right, right. Um, so again, the letters were so innocuous in some ways that uh, that Bernard didn't deny them because he had already said all of those things in public. Hutchinson um, took issue not with the publication. He he didn't claim that the letters had been fabricated. He just believed that the Patriot reaction was um, uh, was unfair because of the way that uh, things were taken out of context. He went to his grave believing that the Patriots had been unfair to him in, in one particular passage of one letter where he seemed to be calling for an abridgment of colonial liberties. And he was, he claimed he was saying, you know, this is going to happen whether they want it or not. Patriots said, this is Hutchinson saying, you know, I want this to happen. So, uh, it's a matter of interpretation, but I, I don't think anyone seriously disputes that these letters um, were real. No other questions from the in-person audience? Okay. Um, we do have a few questions uh, on Zoom. Dr. Taylor, um, can you speak further on the Whig opposition in Parliament, uh, their frustrations and uh, lack of power? How um, how much of a factor is this for us when considering the American Revolution? Yeah, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, we've been thinking about the relationship between the the Whigs in Parliament, the the sort of radical Whig tradition, and the American Revolutionaries since the mid twentieth century. Um, but primarily, we've been thinking about that in terms of the radical ideas that uh, Whig political leaders like John Wilkes uh, articulated and how that appealed to um, patriots and the colonies. And we haven't been looking at the ways that um, the Whig opposition in Britain mobilized a particular set of narratives and a particular like kind of information that, um, that uh, mobilized American Patriots uh, political action. And so um, one of the things that I found when I was doing research for this book was that um, the political uh, uh, scene, I mean, certainly in, in Britain, the political scene was always shifting, but the, uh, the strength of the Whig opposition was centered primarily in London. London, of course, has an outsized role in colonial communications. It's it's where so many newspapers are printed, and um, the Whigs, right, uh, had uh, I don't know I don't know if it was half, but it's, at certain times they had about as many uh, prominent presses as the uh, as the Ministry did, and so when you have um, this mix of London newspapers. Um, that on the one hand is is very easy to discount as being ministry propaganda, and on the other hand, you have this group of opposition newspapers associated with the Whigs um, 
you uh, you know you can sort of see what the Patriots were thinking there, the sort of calculations they were making. They were looking uh, not just through the lens uh, of um, the Whigs, but also really primarily through the lens of uh, London politics, where the Whig opposition was overrepresented and where um, support for the Patriots was more significant than it was in the rest of Britain. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, one other question. Uh, we had a attendee commenting on the, the fact that Ben Franklin <laughs> took a printing press to France uh, during oh, yeah. the American Revolution uh, to print a French language newspaper on the German French borders, uh, you know, basically denouncing the atrocities that were committed by the Hessians over here in North America. Uh, can you comment on that a little bit? It's a great story. Um, so this person's referring to uh, a fake issue of a newspaper that Ben Franklin wrote uh, when he was serving as an American commissioner um, during the, the negotiations for the Treaty of Paris. And he thought that if he could, he wanted to influence, uh, the, he wanted to push his fellow commissioners to um, not sort of settle for uh, terms that were favorable to the British. And so he invented these stories about um, uh, the ones I'm most familiar with. You know, he printed an entire fake issue, but uh, the ones I'm most familiar with are uh, accounts of native allies of the British scalping entire villages of uh, American colonists. And he, he described, it's, it's really brutal actually. Uh, he describes um, uh, uh, bags and bags of scalps of, of colonists. And it's like very thoroughly numbered to sort of give it the sheen of authenticity. But, you know, he just made it up entirely. He was in Paris. He was he was not drawing on any colonial sources, but it actually circulates back to the colonies um, and is reprinted in some American newspapers, uh, despite being, you know, completely forged by Franklin in um, in uh, in Paris, outside of Paris. Uh, and yeah, that that is a fascinating story and just an example of the ways that um, the the circulation of these materials made it so difficult to to determine what was true. Uh, people looked at the the this account, which um, appeared to have been taken from I, I think a New Jersey newspaper. I could be wrong about that, and you know weren't able to sort of trace things back in the way that we we can, but often choose not to do today on the internet. So. Um, so yeah, that's a great story. Rob Parkinson's book, um, The Common Cause, goes into that a bit more. I think his other book, 13 Clocks, does as well. Great, thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, how much did those outside of London even care about what was going on in the colonies or during the American Revolution? That's a good question. Uh, so outside of London, but within Britain, I, I guess. That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I, I know the answer to that. My sense is that uh, less than we might think, <laughs> right? Uh, at, at least until war broke out um, during that the imperial crisis stage that I mostly focused on tonight. Uh, because the colonies were, as I said, sort of a backwater, not necessarily some a place that most people in Europe considered to be um, a particularly interesting or important place. Uh, I think it would have been very easy for people to ignore what was going on there, uh, whether in London or outside of London. Um, I mean, there's a lot going on in the 18th century, and um, no one knew that these these angry Bostonians and um, other other patriot groups were going to uh, were going to keep escalating things and escalating things to the point where you had a revolution, right? This is sort of the, the point that all historians love to stress about, about historical contingency. And I, I think it's probably not until the war that this starts to impact um, less politically engaged uh, Britons in a substantial way. But I could be wrong about that. All right. Well, um, are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, perfect. And I, I was wondering something similar to that last question only um, in, in America, surely there were um, uh, vast numbers of people living in the colonies who just wanted to go about their ordinary lives and 
uh, everyday business without uh, associating themselves with either the patriots or or the um, loyalists they might um, I just wonder if um, um, the people who were politically involved at the time might have been just um, you know a, a small portion of the population I think that's a really really important point and it's something that we don't talk about enough um, sometimes historians refer to that group as the disaffected um, in a lot of cases these were folks who would sort of pretend to be a patriot when the patriot army was in town and then pretend to be a loyalist when when the british army was in town and uh focus mainly on preserving their own uh their own families and um you know feeding each other and taking care of each other right um and one of the great tasks that patriot leaders had during uh the revolution especially in the 1770s was to make sure that the disaffected kind of kept quiet about that, right? And they were able to preserve a sense that they spoke for um, a, a consensus of the community, right? Uh, and I think it's really easy because the Patriots often spoke as if they were the voice of everyone in the colonies, um, except for maybe a few rogue loyalists, right? Um, because they spoke that way and because they, uh, we have so much preserved information, so many accounts from, um, from the Patriots, we can, it's, it's really easy to, to just accept that, but, um, we have to, we have to sort of look beyond that and, um, think more about, you know, what it meant to be a woman, right, who was not expected to be politically engaged or a child or, uh, a farmer who was already on the edge of subsistence before the revolution came. And so there's there's some interesting work being done uh, by other historians about that right now. I always think though about, um, about the ratification of the constitution. Uh, Polly Mayer's great book, uh, Ratification, discusses this. And she, she points out that uh, there were some ratifying conventions where people just couldn't be bothered to even really vote um, you know, this event that is so essential, so seminal in America's history was not exciting <laughs> enough to compel people to overcome those barriers to political action that I talked about. So I, I totally agree with you that that's, that's an important and understudied thing. It just so happens though that it's kind of difficult to, uh, to study people not doing something. You know what I mean? Yeah. All great points. Well, uh, Let's give one more round of applause to uh, Dr. Taylor. And before we officially wrap up, I'd like to remind you that we do have copies of his book on the back table there. Please see my colleague, Paul Newman, if you'd like to purchase a copy. I'd like to thank you all for coming out uh, here and on Zoom this evening and for your continued support of our mission. We will see you all uh, very soon. Get home safe.